rising up onto the Edwards Plateau once again headed west. We are headed to Fort Belknap. Now I know you're thinking, wait a minute, didn't we go to Fort, Nap, uh, Fort Mark Belknap before? And yes, that's true, we did. Um, and we kind of lightly covered it. But today is one of those special days that each of the Texas forts does where they invite people out and they have all kinds of activities. They have reenactors and docents and, and all kinds of things we can look at, take pictures of and things that you don't normally see. And so we're going to Fort Belknap, which is a crazy historical fort that was established in 1851 as part of the second line of Texas Frontier Forts. And all kinds of uh, famous people uh, were there uh, at one time or another. And famous people you probably don't even know about, like Randolph Marcy. Uh, and Randolph Marcy was this surveyor and Oh my goodness gracious, he, you know, he went out and, uh, and mapped the Canadian River and a bunch of other stuff and wrote the book for traveling west in wagon trains or whatever and how to survive on the prairie, everything from uh, reading smoke signals to where to get water and what plants you can eat, all kinds of things. It became the manual for people moving west for I don't know, decades probably. And uh, let's see, uh, McQuellen, uh, who was a lieutenant here, became um, the uh, uh, general of the army under uh, uh, Lincoln, and who was uh, ultimately fired because him and Lincoln didn't get along on strategy, and replaced by General Burnside, that was probably even worse as far as getting along with Lincoln. And ultimately, then Grant took over as General of the Army and then ultimately became President, of course. But all kinds of history kind of originates here at Fort Belknap. This is where Cynthia Ann Parker was brought after Texas Rangers and uh, I think Confederate soldiers uh, rescued her and, uh, uh, and, and, and brought her back to civilization. Well, that didn't go well. And of course, she was the mother of the famous uh, Chief Aquana Parker, who goes down in history in a lot of different ways. Um, and all these things happened in and around Fort Belknap. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the Goodnight Ranch uh, and uh, no, the Loving Ranch is nearby. Charlie Goodnight ended up putting his ranch in the uh, uh, in Paladur Canyon and. Uh, so, uh, okay, so this is kind of the area where, uh, uh, where Lonesome Dove, I guess you could say, kind of originated. So anyway, we're gonna go here and check this out and, and see maybe a, a Sibley tent and some cannons being fired and, and who knows what. So I hope you'll uh, enjoy this video and, uh, and uh, going along on this trip with us at Fort Belknap. This is going to be our first in interview at Fort Belknap days here. We're with Goods Texas Light Field Artillery Battery A with Lieutenant Ray Johnson commanding and he's going to tell us a little bit about the uh, field artillery and then we're going to get to see it uh, fire here in a little bit. So all right go ahead Lieutenant tell us about it. Okay well we've got Goods Light Artillery reenacting uh, to give you a little history about Goods. Goods was one of the 26 artillery batteries for the Confederacy that formed up in Texas. Uh, it actually initiated in Tyler, Texas, went to Fort Worth to uh, recruit, went on to San Antonio to pick up their guns and went off the war. What makes Goods a really unique battery is they fought skirmishes in Texas, on the coast of Texas, in Louisiana, went across the Mississippi and came back intact. All the other batteries were either destroyed or assimilated into others. So they were a very decorated Confederate battery. Okay. Uh, and that's what we're representing. The uh, it's now, as it went on, Goods started it. And then as it went to different field commanders, it took on different names, usually of their, like Lamar and things of that nature. But we have kept it at the early point of uh, 
1861. Yeah, that period in history. Yeah. You got to yes. pick a spot, you right. know, to, right. to do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Well, that that's really interesting to know. I, I'm glad that you picked that. Now, um, so goods actually wasn't just a Texas. Um, uh, I guess unit like like it didn't come to uh, here during the Civil War and, and like some Confederate uh, units did to just to try to protect settlers uh, goods you guys actually bought out in the east and on the coast and and exactly. skirmishes with Union troops whereas right. like some of the CSA units the, like the ones here at Fort Belknap they the only people that they dealt with were like the natives and that kind of thing that that's correct deal. and yeah uh, we were the, we were militarized by the governor of Texas at the time when we joined in as a military unit of the Confederacy and, and we went off to war to fight uh, against the Union troops and yes. where where did you fight you said uh, some in Louisiana yeah, and there Texas some coast? in Texas Texas coast and Louisiana uh, we were the only artillery battery that ever made it past them across the Mississippi all right that was my question and then yeah. came back intact after yeah. You went across Mississippi. Now, where did you fight on the other side of the Mississippi? Uh, there were several skirmishes uh, up there. They, we fought at, uh, I believe, at Chickamauga. We wow. fought at uh, Shiloh. Wow. Uh, some of the uh, other major battles. We didn't get as far as the Gettysburg. But, right. You didn't but, get up into Pennsylvania and all right. that type we of stuff. We did not but, get that far. But uh, Chickamauga and Shiloh, that's impressive. Yeah. i got to say, that's yeah. pretty neat. Um, all right. Well, that's pretty neat. Uh, uh, let's see. What else can you tell us about? Tell us about your uniform. Because this uh, is not the uniform that I would picture for a you know, even a Confederate uh, uh, battery or something. Okay, like well, these yeah. uniforms, you got to understand one thing. Texas did not have a standardized uniform. Oh, well, a lot of didn't. the South didn't, especially right. in the beginning. Most of the, the men and women that went off to battle left with what they had from their house or what they had on their back. Yeah. So, you know, it, uh, this is a, ge a jean wool. And they usually just left with anything they could. Now, if they were managed to get to a depot, then that's where you started seeing the gray uniforms right, come right. in. You know, when you get up there closer to Lee's army and their de their depots, uh, most of them fought with the clothes they had on their back. Well, the first battle that 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 they uh, uh, that between Union Confederate troops. Everybody thought it was going to be over with in minutes, and people were camped out on hills with picnic baskets and things like that to watch it. And it was very confusing because a lot of even the Confederate troops showed up in blue uniforms right. or in all kinds of colors and things right. like that. It was it was it was it was pretty darn confusing. Well, it really you was. Also remember though that a lot of the a lot of Union troops, even you know General Lee, you know he was with the Union, right? And he he chose to leave and, and fight his state Virginia, right? And uh, so, you know, a lot of those uh, men that switched over to the Confederacy were in Union outfits. Already had time. Union uniforms. Already had Union yeah, uniforms. Yeah, yeah. So, and then some of them, a lot of it, supply and demand was down. And the Confederates, they would, if they would hit a supply, they would wear the great coats or the trousers or yeah. of the Union. You know, yeah. that was a kind of a bad day of Black Rock if they got caught in a, yeah. uh, in their, in a di <laughs> different Army's uniform. But... You know, they, they fought and, and scraped and got, you know, accumulated what they could. Right. And that's exactly what it All was. right. Well, let's look at your uniform here. Now, is that yours? Now, yeah, this is one type of a uniform. Now, you'll see a lot of this in Texas. And this was this is a butternut wool. And where the butternut wool come in for them is most of the Texas state prisons were building white wool uniforms for the prisoners. Well... Uh, there was a lot of white wool in Texas, uh, uh, different units uh, during the war, and they decided they didn't want to stand out like a sore thumb. Yeah, and why? So sure. they started dyeing these in pecan holes or walnut holes. Uh, this is not, now their uniforms wasn't as, uh, as done as nice as this one is. Right. Most of them were real modely, but they were basically trying to get white, uh, get rid of the white stigma of the white prison uniforms. Yeah. That's probably the closest uniform that Texas ever got to, uh, was of the white prison uniforms being dyed butternut. Butternut. Right. Well, pecan holes is a great dye. Yeah. I mean, that's a, if you've ever gotten any on your hands, you know that. Exactly. And, uh, um, and because you're uh, uh, a... Uh, uh, artillery unit is that why you're wearing red on your hat that's and all correct. that type of stuff you because know, that's a that's your yeah. classic color for, for right. artillery is you know, red cab and dismounted cab was yellow right you know and then you had the infantry that was a light blue a light or navy blue. blue 
artillery was usually uh, during that time was all red. Mm -hmm. uh, your medical was uh, usually a silver, 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 silver okay. or a green. Yeah, it was uh, a green, yeah, yeah. kind of green. But if you look, it depends on where you were is what you had. So sure. you know, but as a rule, it was green for usually medical and stuff right. like that. So yeah, that, it's it basically the same today. Too. Right. So, no. Yeah. It really is. Sure. And, and like I was telling one of your guys over here, uh, the first cab in 1973, 74, and 75 experimented with everybody having a, wearing a hat, a beret, that was the color of their job. Right. And it was, it was, it was a colorful division. It, it, you know, I mean, you, everybody had, uh, as a, as a, uh, uh, as a armor crewman, I had a black beret, but armor crew crewmen have been wearing black berets since Patton, you know, since World War II, something like that. And uh, because of the, just the need to have a hat that could go in and well, out. Well, you talk about the hats, you know, yeah. today's standards, well, they had the same thing. There was, they, most of them were cappies. Yeah. And, and cappies either had a red band around it for artillery yeah. or blue for entry and there was, or yellow. And there was a little, or there was a little bit of color somewhere. Somewhere you know, on, 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 you know, uh, on the Most of them didn't have, uh, the officers really didn't have a bunch of major insignias except maybe on the collar. Yeah. Whether it's lieutenant bars or, yeah, yeah, you know, something. some of that nature. Yeah. Or captains would just wear a gold scrolling leaf up each one of the sleeves. Right. right. They, and then the designated color of what unit they were in. So. Right. Yeah, sure. That kind of thing. Now, would uh, goods uh, battery or the unit at the time be relatively dressed alike? The the photographs that I've seen of goods, uh, pretty much so. Uh, they you know you could so definitely tell. Of course, you couldn't tell about colors. Most of those are all black and right, white right. or brown type pictures. But usually they all had a, some kind of a sack coat. Now, whether it was a Confederate sack coat or a Union sack coat, the picture does not distinguish that. No. Uh -huh. But it's like most of the Confederate units, they would be just, uh, nobody had a, just a standardized uniform unless you were over in further north and you was in Lee's Army where you could get the, the blue trousers and the gray vest and the gray the sack coats and the gray. Yeah. Gray coats. Uh, you're not, you didn't see uh, any. And a gray cappy. You know. You know I right? mean, you around here, that. you're not even going to see a gray cappy. No. No. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And some of that stuff, actually, unfortunately, was picked up off of battlefields. And, yeah. You know, the, off of the dead. So sure. on both sides. So yeah. it's it's. Uh, well, Texas never was one before just a standardized uniform. So. You know, if somebody represents a Confederate and they don't have a uniform, that doesn't mean a thing because they didn't have a standardized one anyway. So yeah. they, they left off to the war with what they had on their back, most of them. And so, all right. Uh, oh, wow. All right, we're about to see a demonstration of Goods Artillery, okay? Now, that was the person's name, that was the commander's name, uh, and uh, it was good, and we heard about that earlier. And this is a demonstration. We've got five cannon here, and two of them are, I think, are uh, are the the what was newer in the Civil War of the rifle barrel type cannons, which go great distance and with great accuracy. And then two or three of the others are uh, not rifled, which fires just kind of a, a, a round or sometimes a, uh, uh, a like a. Uh, canister looking thing just a round bolt they called it so we're going to see these fire several different volleys and in several different ways for several different kinds of effect now sometimes you fire uh every you have you line up a whole battery and you fire every one of them you want all those rounds landing on a target at the same time very devastating morally and physically and other times you want to fire and then it half a second later fire another one and fire another one. that's for a whole different effect as far as demoralizing an enemy. So you're going to see some examples of this type of firing coming up in a few minutes. Gun one. Off from the right. Off the muzzle flash. Gun one. Fire. 